studying the book of 2 Corinthians together, and we are in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. Chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians go together as Paul talks about a collection he is taking among Gentile churches to help meet the needs of Jewish believers in the church of Jerusalem. And it's an opportunity for the Gentiles to show their love and appreciation for the Jewish believers and the blessings that have come to them as Gentiles because of God's promises given to the Jews, the covenant made with Abraham that we Gentiles are privileged to benefit from the blessings promised to all nations, the Jewish Messiah died not just for Jews, but for the sins of the world. So Paul sees this offering as very important and an opportunity for these Gentile Christians to show their love for their Jewish brethren. Church at Corinth is noted as a difficult church. In some ways, that's sad. Because it's a church with overflowing grace at work in it. Paul testifies to that back in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. He said in verse 7, if you remember, just as you abound in everything. Then the end of verse 7, see that you abound in this grace work also. We're never done growing. The problem with the Corinthians As God worked in his grace in their lives, there were many things that were tolerated or practiced there that shouldn't be. This made Paul's ministry with them more difficult. And much of his letters have to be taken up with explaining himself or defending himself. That's been true with 2 Corinthians. There was a challenge from within the church and the problems for Paul come from within the church. He suffered because of persecution at the hands of unbelievers. But when dealing with the churches, the problems came when people were unsettled within the church. Paul didn't keep his travel schedule as he had told the Corinthians he would. And so we saw in the opening portion of this letter, there were questions about his integrity and could he be trusted since he didn't do what he said in that area. Maybe that would raise questions in other areas. He talked about the ministry God had given him as an apostle, a minister of the new covenant. But that puts him in conflict with some of the teaching that had infiltrated among the church at Corinth. And after we leave chapter 9, we'll move into the closing chapters of the book that focus on Paul having to explain and defend his apostleship. And he said the real problem is Unbelievers have infiltrated among the church and raised questions. We're talking about money. This is another opportunity for questions to be raised about Paul. He's going to take a collection back to Jerusalem. The Corinthians are going to contribute to that collection. There's already questions about Paul and money. Now the questions in the letters to the Corinthians and the challenges vary, but one thing all the people have in common that are challenging Paul is they have problems with Paul. Uh, Whether it's about his integrity, his travel plans, his doctrine, his and he's not uh, unaware that some question him about money. Uh, They already have. It was in his first letter. This becomes foundational for understanding the section we're moving into in chapter 8 and into chapter 9. The extra measures he has to take to try to deflect the criticisms that uh, are coming. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9.
Paul raises the issue in verse 6. Do only Barnabas and I have a right, not have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard does not eat the fruit of it? Who tends a flock does not use the milk of the flock? Even the law supports this. You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. The point God was making with that is those doing the labor should benefit from their labor as he applies that in uh, verse uh, 10. In verse 11, then, he says the principle for his ministry is if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things? If others share the right over you, do not we not more, the more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right. In a second, he's talking about that we don't have to use all the rights in our liberty. But examining it here, Paul being extra careful about what might be said in his motives regarding money. Um, verse 13 in the Old Testament, the priests that served in the tabernacle were per- privileged to partake of the sacrifices brought to the tabernacle. Verse 14, so the principle is the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to live, get their living from the gospel. But I have used none of these things. And I'm not writing to you to stir sympathy, so you will do it. He wouldn't tell you of the Corinthians because they wouldn't understand. Uh, that didn't solve it. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll be getting here. Uh, and here's part of the section where Paul will be defending his apostleship and responding to the attacks that come. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel, the gospel of God to you without charge. I robbed other churches by taking for ages from them to serve you. We'll see this when we get there, but you can't win. The critics of Paul have a more foundational issue with Paul. So if he took money, they criticize him for being greedy. He doesn't take money, they criticize him. See, he's not a genuine apostle. People don't even think he's worth paying. Um, But what he really says is, I robbed other churches. I didn't really rob them. But what he did, he took money from them to support his ministry to the Corinthians. So nobody could say he was preaching the gospel at Corinth for financial benefit. Come back to Acts chapter 18. This is where Paul first visited Corinth and brought the gospel. And you see how he worked there. He leaves the chapter 18 of uh, Acts opens. Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Uh, he had been in Macedonia, the churches of Macedonia that we've talked about, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea establishing those, preaching the gospel in that area. Comes down, preaches the gospel at Mars Hill in Athens, a very well-known setting. Now he's coming to Corinth. When he comes to Corinth, Acts 18, 2, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. We have historical records for that. So Paul came to them, uh, their fellow believers, and they are of the same trade in verse 3. He, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. They were working by trade. They were tent makers or leather workers. But often the leather worker was another name for tent makers, but they could be broader than just tents. But that's what Paul did. He worked with his hands to sell things so he could support himself, pay his bills. And he was reasoning, verse 4, in the synagogue every Sabbath trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, where had Paul had preached the gospel and seen people converted and so on, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, 
Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. When Silas and Timothy followed him down from Macedonia, they brought gifts from the Macedonians. We won't go there, but at the end of the book of Philippians, the letter to the church at Philippi, he remarks, more than once you sent a gift to me. So Paul took money from other churches to support his ministry to the Corinthians. So there would be no question that raised. Didn't keep people from raising questions, from questioning Paul's motives, challenging why he didn't take money, as well as questioning uh, and him having to explain why he didn't. So you can imagine in this kind of environment, now Paul's coming and saying he's going to receive money that was collected at Corinth and take it to Jerusalem. Oh, so Paul was just softening you up by looking like he wasn't going to take money from you. But he's going to come and we've spent all this time collecting this money because Paul has hands that are clean, of course. And he's going to take it to Jerusalem. Ha ha, how do you know? How do you know he won't take off a significant amount on the way? And what he takes to Jerusalem will be minor. And he'll say, well, I had to have some for my... Exp-. Paul is going to deal with that. That's where we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So come back there if you will. I know some of you don't think this is possible for me, but we're going to go slow. That's not the impossible part. <laughs> then we're going to go fast. It's a miracle. Wait and see. So we'll spend more time on the first part of the section. Then we'll uh, be able to overview the last part. What Paul is explaining in verse 16 of chapter 8 all the way down through chapter 9, verse 5 is what he is doing and why he is doing it that will help secure the integrity of this offering. He's going to, first of all, send three men to Corinth. And they will be responsible to see that the Corinthians are following through on the commitment they made. They're not there to try to raise more money. They're there to encourage the Corinthians to follow through on what they committed themselves to do. Paul realizes with the passing of time, some of the enthusiasm for this offering could have waned. And it will be to their benefit. Paul is committed. When he comes, he's not going to be taking an offering. He'll receive what has already been collected. So these three men... He'll vouch for their integrity. We'll help keep things above board. And then the Corinthians will ha- also have opportunity if they want to appoint representatives from their church to travel with Paul to Jerusalem with the offering, that'll be fine. You know, we've talked about grace, and Paul's going to refer to this offering as a work of grace again in the section we're going to look at. And Paul poured himself and all his energy into what he's doing. He'll tell the Romans in the letter he'll write to Rome while he's at Corinth, I'd love to come see you and preach the gospel there. I can't wait to do that. But first I have to take the offering to Jerusalem. And he say, well, it's just money. Anybody can do that. No, this is God's grace at work. It's just as important as anything. So we see the quality of men that uh, are coming to Corinth to see that the offering is collected. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 8. But thanks be to God. Again, this is all emphasis Emphasis on what God is doing. He is the one to receive the glory. Down in verse 19, toward the end, he'll say it's for the glory of the Lord himself. That word thanks, as we noted when we 
uh, just overviewed these two chapters, is the basic word grace. Chorus. And thanks is a natural translation of it because I'm in contact, some in context like this, that's what it means. And you can see how it flows because if someone is gracious toward you, that expresses thanks. Uh, grace and thanks go together. Uh, so thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. And you see, this is a work of God. God puts the same earnestness in the heart of Titus. So God is at work here, as in everything Paul's involved in. We see him saying it's the hand of God, it's the work of God. Um, we've talked about this. We live in the realm of grace, his enabling, empowering grace. You're not saying that God put the same earnestness in Titus to carry the gospel to a new unevangelized area. That would be the grace of God. But this is just as much the work of God. In the life of Paul and Titus and the other two men that will be mentioned, he puts the same earnestness, zeal, Passion, enthusiasm on your behalf in the heart of Titus. Uh, I don't think you could survive in ministry with Paul if you weren't passionate about it. If you weren't committed, as we would say, heart and soul. If this wasn't something you could be enthusiastic about. Put your heart into it. Um, Paul was greatly used of God because doing the work of God, even if it's the financial aspect, well, that's not as important to preaching the gospel. This is the work of God in my heart and life. He puts this zeal, this passion, this enthusiasm in my heart. He's put the same passion and enthusiasm in the heart of Titus. That's greatly encouraging. You know, I draw upon the grace of God, his enablement, his strength, and what happens? We pour ourselves into that ministry God is giving us to do, that way of serving him, and we do it with enthusiasm. Uh, God has blessed us as a church with so many people who pour themselves and their passion, their hearts in it, into so many of the areas of the ministry, which enables the body to function. Paul has to testify to the earnestness of Titus. We have to say something about Titus. Uh, he's, his name is familiar to us because Paul wrote a letter to him, the letter to Titus. Um, so name-wise, he's familiar, but you know, he's not mentioned very much in Scripture. Uh, several times in the letters of the Corinthians. But outside of that, just a, a few references. Uh, evidently saved under Paul's ministry, but we don't have any details on it. He's not mentioned by name in the book of Acts. Yet he's a man who traveled with Paul, was with Paul on key occasions. Come back to Acts 15. I want to look at you... Uh, a few things about Titus. Appreciate the quality of men that Paul sees to be involved in this ministry of fundraising for Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15 is what is called the Jerusalem Council because there is a meeting with the apostles and elders in the city of Jerusalem to resolve a key, crucial theological issue on what is the content of the gospel. What must you believe to be saved? So the chapter opens up. Some men came down from Judea. And you're aware in the Bible, no matter where you are or where you're going, you come down from Jerusalem. 
You can be going to the far north. You come down from Jerusalem. You don't want to get confused uh, the way we would talk about direction. No matter what direction you go, uh, you're going down from Jerusalem. So they came down from Jerusalem, and on this occasion, they're going north. Uh, they began teaching the brethren, unless you were circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. The confusion comes here because these are people who profess to believe in Jesus. They're Jews. So you have the problem within. This is where Paul has to constantly deal the major issues Fragmenting the church come from within. Um, there's outside persecution, but that usually doesn't divide the church. What divides the church is what is taking place within. Here, they're saying you must be circumcised to be saved. Paul and Barnabas have great dissension with them. They debate with them. Finally, they say this has to be resolved. Well, remember, the apostles have remained located and centered in Jerusalem. Even the persecution after Stephen, under Paul's leadership, before his conversion in chapter 9, scattered everybody but not the apostles. That sort of becomes a theological center. So they're all going to go to Jerusalem before the apostles and elders. The end of verse 2. To go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So they traveled to Jerusalem. They received, verse 4, by the church, the apostles and the elders. They give testimonies. Verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed. Now we've got confusion. They profess to believe in Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. They profess to believe that he died on the cross and was raised from the dead as the penalty for sin. They're believers. But they stood up saying, verse 5, it's necessary to circumcise them, direct them to observe the law of Moses. So they're not denying what we would call the gospel of Christ. They're just saying that's not enough. There's a certain logic that they could claim Because, as we've talked about before, God gave the law to Moses. Why would he now say it's not necessary? He's just shown that his son will come and provide salvation. So now our keeping of the law can be complete because of his finished work. Something like that. So you have the debate go on. Peter stands up. And testifies how he was the instrument used to bring the gospel to Gentiles. And they were saved by faith. Without circumcision. And the law was just a yoke. No one could ever keep it. For his conclusion, verse 11. We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. We Jews are saved the same way Gentiles would be saved. Everybody's going to be saved in the same way. By faith alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as we would put it. And they're listening. Then James stands up. The resolution there. You don't have to keep the law. You don't have to go out of your way to offend Jews. Uh, You have to be careful. But keeping the law is not part of the gospel. Now, while we're here... Titus is not mentioned, but come over to uh, to Galatians just after 2 Corinthians. So if you get back to 2 Corinthians, right after 2 Corinthians, come to Galatians chapter 2. He says, as he opens the chapter, after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. That's significant because as the chapter goes on, we're talking about the conference at Jerusalem in Acts 15. It says in verse 3, Not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, 
was compelled to be circumcised. Paul went up to the conference at Jerusalem ready to do battle. And he took with him a fellow worker who is an uncircumcised Gentile. Oh. He had Timothy circumcised because Timothy comes in a mixed line. One of his parents being Jewish, one being Gentile. And uh, Paul's not intending to offend Gentiles. Not wrong for a Jew to be circumcised. It's a sign of uh, being a descendant in the covenant line of Abraham, but it's not a part of his salvation. But he wouldn't circumcise Titus. So you see, here we see, and we don't know how long Titus has been saved, evidently converted under Paul. We'll see that in a moment. But he's in the thick of things. He's there when they're battling over what is the gospel that brings salvation. Uh, and they go on to talk about that. We just wanted to note Titus is there. Come over to the book of Titus. We're talking about Titus that we at least ought to look at his book. You have First and Second Timothy and then you have Titus. Then you'll be just before Hebrews. There's a little one-chapter book, Philemon, there, but uh, you're getting uh, almost to the book of Hebrews there. Titus. And uh, just look at chapter 1. He says in verse 4, he is writing this to Titus, my true child in a common faith. And that expression, similar way, he would refer to Timothy, my son in the faith, seemed to indicate Titus had been saved as Timothy had under the ministry of Paul. But we don't know when, perhaps on the first missionary journey, as evidently Timothy was. And a young man who had grown and becomes a very reliable companion of Paul. Come over to chapter 3, uh, verse 12 of uh, this letter. To Titus. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis. I have decided to spend the winter there. So you get an idea of what Timothy's ministry is going to be. Come back to chapter 1, verse 5. He travels with Paul and he goes to places representing Paul where Paul needs a reliable person who won't be shaken. And in verse 5 of chapter 1, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Paul had, uh, tra had Titus traveling with him to Crete. Paul had to move on from Crete, but things had to be put together on a more solid basis in the churches at Crete. So he leaves Titus to do it. He has to appoint elders. Be sure these men meet the qualifications. Why is this necessary? Verse 10. There are many rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. They must be silenced. They're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for sordid gain. Titus is left at Crete. It's a difficult situation. False teachers have had such an impact that there's families in the churches at Crete that are already unsettled. So I've got to appoint godly men, stand against the false teachers, oppose their doctrine, get things in order. And uh, he's off in another place when we read in chapter 3, verse 12. Paul wants him to come and spend the winter with him in Nicopolis. Nicopolis is on the west coast of Greece. Um, you know, being part of Paul's life and ministry uh, was strenuous in many ways. You just didn't get in uh, an airplane and zip over there or an air-conditioned car and drive. You know, travel itself was its own pressure. But Titus is a trustworthy man. At the end of Paul's life, you're in Titus, uh, just in the last chapter of 2 Timothy, so it may be on the same pages in your Bible or a page back. 2 Timothy is just before Titus. and We want the last chapter of 2 Timothy and look at verse 10. He tells Timothy, make every effort, in verse 9, to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Sad testimony, because Demas had been a man 
who had faithfully worked with Paul. He appears on other occasions. Uh, but he didn't finish well. He's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Um, Dalmatia being what used to be known as Yugoslavia, but now those countries that are there. Um, but Paul had him on another mission. He had everything been with, with Rome, in Rome with Paul in his last imprisonment here. But he had to go out and represent Paul and uh, minister in another area. So all this to say, he is a man of uh, proven quality. A man to be trusted. And he's the man who's going to be the point man for this offering. Paul picks the best. Well, you know, it's material things. We're not talking about carrying the gospel to a new area. Couldn't somebody... No, Paul puts the best in. And so you see the importance of this. Come back to 2 uh, Corinthians 8. God had put the same earnestness, zeal on behalf of the Corinthians in the heart of Titus that Paul had in his heart. You know, God gets the credit. But there is the response to that. Well, I wish God would put in my heart some kind of passion for doing his work and serving him. Uh, we have to go back to Philippians. I told you we'd go slow the first part. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. This is one of the Macedonian churches. And if I was being sent somewhere, I'd have rather been sent to the Philippians than I would have the Corinthians. They don't seem to have near as many problems, but verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Your responsibility. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's why you do all things without grumbling and murmuring. If you recognize God is at work in me, am I grumbling about what God is doing? Makes sense. You work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't mean it doesn't require effort on my part. Zeal, passion. What is the foundation of that? My submission to the Spirit who dwells in me and the enabling grace of God that I want to serve the Lord with everything I have. The world may view it as mundane and less important. I see it as part of my service in manifesting the grace of God in my life. Um, so we don't live our lives in the realm of the mundane, just dragging ourselves along. Uh, we are instruments of God's grace, testimonies of that grace, as we will be for all eternity. Come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Titus, he not only accepted our appeal, verse 17, but being himself very earnest. You see, he puts it in earnest. He wants these Corinthians to know, Titus is not coming reluctantly to minister among you and to uh, help encourage this collection. He has a passion for you. Not a passion for your money, a passion for you. And to see God's grace overflow in this area of your life. Just like you do with your children. You love them. You want to see them growing and maturing and developing in every area of their life. This is Titus saw the Corinthians, and he's like Paul. We read the Corinthians. I read the Corinthians, and I say, oh, man, trouble, trouble, complaint, complaint, this, that, the other thing. And I've shared with you, my professor early in my training said, teach Corinthians early. It will cover all the problems you'll have to deal with. What a testimony for a church. Uh, look at Indian Hills. Examine their history. You'll cover every problem you're going to face. Yikes. Uh, immature, divisive, untrusting. Well, Paul says, I see you overflowing in grace. Titus is enthusiastic about you. Uh, these are not basket cases. 
These are the children of God. The work of his grace. Um, and Titus is, has, is himself very earnest. The same earnestness as Paul. He's gone to you of his own accord. He responded to my appeal, but he didn't come because of my appeal. That's the point. He not only accepted our appeal, but he had the same passion for you that I have. So he came of his own accord. When Paul talked to Titus about how beneficial it would be if he would go to Corinth, Paul, uh, Titus was already ahead of him. I've loved, I'd love to go to Corinth. That's been the desire of my heart, to go and see this through and see them grow in grace in this area. Not like I joked, oh, do I have to go to Corinth? You know what they're like, Paul. They're going to be complaining about you. They're going to be complaining about this. They're going to find fault with that. You know, there's teachers there that shouldn't be teaching. We know that because Paul's going to cover that in chapters 10 and following. We know his apostleship is still under attack at Corinth. Um, and yet, Titus has a zeal for them. We want to appreciate that and trust that will be characteristic of a passion to be used of God in other people's lives, even here in helping them with their finances and handling it in a way that manifests grace. Verse 18, it's not only Titus who's coming. Uh, there's two other men, and they're not named. Maybe they are not known in the church at Corinth, and Titus will introduce them. But they'll know something about them when they come. They have the complete support of Paul and high recommendation. Uh, we have sent along with him the brother whose fame in the gospel has spread to all the churches. Here's a man whose ministry in the gospel has become well known in a variety of churches. We sometimes think of that word fame as somewhat shallow, flimsy. Um, but the word means praise. Um, he has a reputation that is to be respected. He's well known. He's been greatly used in the ministry of the gospel. And many of the churches are aware of this. Uh, an established record. Again, uh, Paul having men of highest quality. Well, he has fame in the gospel. I'm not going to pull him out to do an offering, uh, carry an offering. Anybody can do that. No, anybody can't. And besides, this is all part of the ministry of God's grace, remember. When we lose sight of this, we can become careless, lackadaisical, and not have that zeal and passion about what we're doing. We say, well, anybody can do this. Um, but God has put me here to do this. It's because of his grace working in my life. I can do it with, quote, a smile in my heart, passion in my heart for it. It has to be done well. How privileged I am to serve him in this way. Uh, so we have the brother. And he is not only well known among the churches in the ministry of the gospel, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us. So what Paul's doing is deflecting any criticism. And you never deflect at all. Um, I've come to expect no matter what the conflict uh, in, happens in our church, I will be part of it. And that's true of the leaders. That's true here. And if Paul just sends Titus, what do they say? Of course he's in Titus. Who do we know that's closer to Paul than Titus? So what kind of check on Titus is he going to be? You just have two men who would agree to support one another. So let me tell you, I have a third man coming. 
And he wasn't appointed by me for this task. He's so well known with a godly reputation and effective ministry in the churches, they appointed him to come. So he is an outside person, if you will. Inside, and Paul calls him a brother, and he shares in the same ministry, but he hasn't been a close traveling companion, evidently, of Paul, like Titus has been. And he's traveling with us, and Paul keeps bringing it back, in this grace work. This gracious work. Paul keeps, like we said, he doesn't talk about money. He keeps talking about grace. This grace work. Now this man is traveling with us. So we come from Macedonia. Perhaps he came from Galatia, or the churches in Galatia, or Asia. We don't know. Um. But he's traveling with us in this grace work. It's being administered by us, served by us. Same word that Paul used for his ministry in preaching the gospel. It's the word of being a servant. We get the word deacon from it. Uh, this serving. Uh, I'm just a servant. Well, that's right. That's what Paul was. So I'm just a servant here. This is for the glory of the Lord himself. And it shows our readiness. Here we are to be used. It's for the glory of the Lord himself. You know, isn't it great to live a life where all of our life is to bring glory to God? Um, doing things that other people would say, oh, it's just, you know, I just don't know. I can't put my heart into it. Now maybe I need to get apart with the Lord and say, Lord, your grace is to be the motivating factor in my life. You don't have me in places where my service is worthless. You don't put me in situations where there's no point to it. I'm here by your appointment to bring glory to you. Your grace can provide for me and in me the passion and the zeal. And I need to see this in such a way that I'll apply myself with that zeal. Uh, it's for the glory of the Lord. We're not just going to transport money from this location to this location. We're doing something for the glory of the Lord. There's a testimony of his grace and the love and the bond among God's people. We are taking precaution so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. Why do I have Titus? Why do I have this well-known man of fame in the ministry who has been appointed by the churches? We are trying to take every precaution so no one will discredit us in our service of this, and I love the way Paul talks about it. It's not just a gift, it's a lavish gift. It's a generous gift. Because how else would you give when you're displaying God's grace that overflows in your life? And then he quotes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4. For we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You uh, wouldn't want to have any question. And unbelievers, he realizes uh, they're mixed in. He has to deal with them in the letter to the Corinthians as well. But uh, we have to be of good reputation. So he wouldn't want the unbeliever to be able to point and say, yeah, Paul, he didn't take money when he came and preached at Corinth, but he lays the foundation. Then when he comes back, he can take it and really milk it out of the people. So he's careful that there wouldn't be anything that would not look right. We have sent with him our brother. Here's another one. We're going to have a third coming. We have sent with him our brother, whom we have often tested. Another unnamed individual. But Paul has had opportunity to minister with him on repeated occasions. We have often tested him. He's come through the fire, so to speak. This word tested, uh, usually used to refer to those who have passed the test, been tested and approved. 
often tested and found diligent in many things. You see, Apostle Paul's looking for someone who's faithful in what he does. If you're not faithful in little things, how will you be faithful in much? As uh, Jesus talked about during his earthly ministry. Is there some little thing I can do? Then I'll pour myself into it because I'm doing it for the Lord. It may not be much in the eyes of people, but it's a way for me to bring glory to the Lord and manifest his grace. We've often tested him, found diligent in many things, but now even more diligent because of his great confidence in you. Yeah, Paul has been concerned that they understand these people coming are not just people who could care less about the Corinthians. They just care about the offering they're getting. These are people that think well of you. He has confidence in you. So he knows something about the church at Corinth. Whether he's ever been there, we don't know. He's not named, but he's heard of it. Paul's talked to him. As for Titus, he's my partner, fellow worker among you. Uh, I mean, he and Titus have ministered together. Titus has been Paul's representative to Corinth and the Corinthian church on prior occasion. So he's my partner, my fellow worker. We're fellowshippers in the ministry. For our bre- As for our brethren, they're messengers of the churches. The word apostles here, but they're not apostles in the limited sense. The word apostle is a sent one. And these are apostles of the churches, sent, representing the churches. They're a glory to Christ. So you can see here, here are men who would care about you, whether they've ever been there or not. Just like you might go to a church you've never been to or meet believers, you care about them. And if you have opportunity you want to be used in their life positively. Maybe you're someplace and you say, I'm only going to be here a month, but I'd like to help in any way I can, kind of thing. An opportunity to be used in their lives. Therefore, openly before the churches. Now here you see the testimony of the Corinthians is at stake. Openly before the churches. Show them the proof of your love. You know, as we talked about, we looked at passages. Uh, people like to say, well, I have love, it's in my heart. But if it's true biblical love, it will come out in practice. It's a demonstration that your love is genuine and real. And Paul sees this offering as that. Then we looked at the passages, you know, if your brother has need and you have opportunity to help and you don't, how can you say you love him? You don't just love in word, you love in deed. So that's what he's saying. This will be the proof of your love. You pass the test and so, on, and so to speak. And for our reason of boasting about you. I mean, Paul's bragged on them. So you see, he never says, I'm giving you a command. He never talks about money and amounts. But he says, I've been bragging in a good sense. They're committed to the Lord and being used of him in a great way in this offering. All right, now we're going fast. The first five verses of chapter nine, in four minutes, we will mark this date as a record in my 46 year ministry. First chapter opens up, it's because he's just gonna summarize now why he's done this. It is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints. Uh, you already know about it. I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians. He's in Macedonia when he writes this letter. That a K has been prepared since last year. Your zeal has stirred most of them. I've already talked about them. Your testimony and commitment of declaring what you were going to do has already had an impact. Not just your doing of it, but your testimony that you're going to do it. Your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I have sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case, so that, as I was saying, you may be prepared. 
I realize, and Paul puts it, you know, delicately here. It's been over a year. I realize other things come in, you get busy, and you may have just lost track of where you are and time or whatever. Um, so this, I sent them just so you would be reminded and would have a chance to uh, do whatever you haven't done. So I thought it necessary, uh, verse 4, otherwise if any Macedonians come with me, because he may pick up people from the church at Macedonia, which would indicate these two men traveling with Titus probably weren't from Macedonia. But if anybody, you know, the church of Macedonia say, we have a couple of men, we'd like to come with you to carry that offering. If any of the Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, Paul referring to himself, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence. In other words, it would be embarrassing because I went ahead and told them what you said you were going to do. And if you don't do it, I'm going to be embarrassed. Uh, I sort of put myself out on a limb here. And I, you know, I'm not going to say more than that, except it could be embarrassing for you too. Uh, is what he's saying, how he puts it. So you don't see these three men coming in and we're here acting on Paul's benefit. Get the money out. Uh, no, it's more than that. I've done it for, you're good. Out of concern for you. I want you to look good. Just like you do in your own family and with your kids. What do you do? You know they said they were going to do something and other people are going to examine it. I just, you know, have you done it? Are you ready? You'll be embarrassed because you told them you'd do it. Um, did you do it? Uh, you know, if they've said they'll cut the neighbor's lawn while they're on vacation, you know the neighbors are coming back. You might say, you know, I told them you'd do a great job. It's going to be sort of embarrassing for me if you didn't. And it'll probably be embarrassing for you because you're the one who said you'd do a great job for them. Sort of how Paul's putting it. One minute. Verse 5. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go ahead to you, arrange beforehand your previously promised, and I just love the way Paul puts it, bountiful gift, so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift, not affected by covetousness. Paul can see no reason, and he keeps track of the, it keeps touch with the Corinthian church, that the Corinthian church should not be able to meet their commitment. That doesn't mean in the year or so, some have situations that have changed for the worse and won't maybe be able to contribute as much, but others may have done better. So Paul sees overall the commitment of the church that they made, they should be able to do. And he doesn't let them off. Whatever you do, remember, is between you and the Lord. And whether it's little or much, it won't make any difference. No, we came to collect the bountiful gift, the lavish offering, because that's consistent with what the Corinthians do. And that's what the Macedonians did compared to what they have. So the Corinthians, and he's not saying they have to do more, but they should do what they committed. That same zeal that gets you fired up to do it should still be motivating you as you come to the conclusion. So God's grace at work using his people in special ways to do his work. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, the blessings that are ours as your children, saved by your grace, cleansed from our sin, made new. And now, slaves, servants of the living God, your grace working in us and through us, not just in mediocre little ways, but overflowing in our lives. In what other people might look at as insignificant things. They're not insignificant. Because I'm doing this because God has placed me here. He's placed this responsibility upon me. I am his servant, 
demonstrating his grace in my life and at work for the benefit of others. Use us together as a church family that your grace might overflow into the lives of others. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.